that, you know, and they ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. You're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. In a world where most of the best shows on television end up being cancelled far too soon, or they live long enough to see themselves be ruined. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? <coughs> I feel it my duty to bring attention to those rare few that maintain such a high bar year after year. Billions is one of these shows, and after just completing its fourth season, with one of the best season finales in recent memory, I am in awe with how a show about hedge funds and district attorneys manages to stay so engaging and exciting. Tell me a few years ago that one of my favorite shows would end up being one focusing around the bureaucracy of politics and stock market managing, and I would not have believed you. But it's true, and as Billions continues to invest into its three leads, Chuck Rhodes, Bobby Axelrod, and Wendy Rhodes, it quickly becomes something so much more personal than the seemingly dry premise would have you believe. Bobby Axelrod, played by a daunting and emphatic Damian Lewis, is a billionaire and head of his own hedge fund company, one of the most profitable in the world. This company will not wait for an uncertain future. We will make our own future. We will fight back hard. We will mobilize the war machine, and those who would try to bring down our house will see their own houses fall. For those who have no idea what a hedge fund is, it's okay. I had no idea what one was before watching Billions either. What is hedge fund? A hedge fund is an investment fund that pools institutional capital from accredited and investors and invests it in a variety of risk management Often it is a fund for guided by investment managers and complex Actually, scratch that. Basically, it's a company whose job is to take other companies or wealthy individuals' money and turn it into even more money. Because when you have a fuck ton of money and power, the only thing left to do is figure out ways to get even more of it. And as you would guess, Playing with these levels of fuck you money lends itself to committing acts that are not exactly legally or morally above board. So with acts, you have a guy that has not only created an empire all his own, but he fostered it from nothing whilst continually dodging criminal charges and trappings of the federal government. Axelrod is the king of scrupulous money managing and the great white whale of shameless business practices. Chuck Rhodes, played by the force of nature that is Paul Giamatti, is the metaphorical Ahab to Bobby's Moby Dick, the US attorney who's never lost a financial prosecution case, and the man who's determined to be the one to take down the untouchable Bobby Axelrod. Well, we didn't get what we wanted, but we got something. Bill Stern, get the FBI on him now. I want this motherfucker's genome mapped. That is how deep I want this to go. Find out how he got what he got on Pepsom and whatever else dirty he may do in this life. I want to put him on the rack and stretch him until he gives us X. Both of these men are titans of their respective fields. Men who believe wholeheartedly in what they do and what they represent, which we'll get into a bit later. And that unflinching drive has allowed them to surpass every obstacle previously in their wake. An on-screen rivalry like theirs would be more than a sufficient premise for top-tier television. But Billions takes things one step further and adds one final piece to this triforce of contentious perfection. Chuck's wife, Wendy Rhodes, played by the stunning and enrapturing Maggie Sith, acts as both an accelerant and inhibitor to the nuclear reactor that is Chuck's and Axelrod's rivalry. Wendy was first one of Axe's closest friends, and that afforded her the position of performance coach and on-site psychiatrist for Axe Capital. No, it's where you've made yourself fit because you're so bound up in being the smallest, most helpful, unobtrusive version of yourself. Just like your mother shits on your head for. Now what you need to do 
To prove her wrong and prove it to yourself is something totally out of character, big and bold, something public that terrifies you in order to free yourself. But her now husband is the man vying to be the one who will successfully prosecute her boss and best friend. This relationship between the three of them, a three-way war of attrition that is constantly teetering between self-destruction and self-preservation, sets the stage for a story that explores the peaks and depths of human psychology and philosophy. Because this is not simply a story about money, power, laws, or politics. This is a story of the very nature of morality and what it means to be right or wrong. This is the dramatization of a game where philosophical ideology is the wager and it is more valuable than any sum of money or branch of power. This is why you should watch Billions. The first thing you should know about Billions is that this is a show that has zero interest in holding your hand. What I mean by that is that there is rarely a time when the show is going to slow down, explain, or simplify what is happening to make things easier for you. I don't know about any of you, but I for one love when a show respects the intelligence of the audience enough to not overtly explain anything. My favorite shows are the ones that keep me on my toes. They keep me second guessing and thinking just as much as they keep me entertained. This is a tremendously difficult thing to balance. And not every show needs to do this to be great. But for my time and attention, this is what often elevates a good show to a great one. Nothing takes me out of it faster than when you slam on the brakes so that the characters can toss expository dialogue back and forth. If you're not confident in the story you're telling or the theme you're attempting to get across, breaking it down and spoon feeding it to the audience is never what is going to save it. So with Billions, there's a few examples of how this is handled to great effect. The first and most obvious is of course the plot maneuverings involving Axe's hedge fund and Chuck's employment by the federal government. Now, Billions could have done its best to explain how these bureaucracies work, but instead, Billions gives the viewer just enough information to get the gist of the events that are taking place. You may not fully grasp how Axe is making money, or how Chuck is manipulating politics, but you fully understand why, and the ramifications of whether it ended poorly or soundly for those involved. Billions doesn't linger on the details, because that is not what is important to the story being told. What is important is how the characters are reacting to these events, and what those events mean for the ever-evolving game moving forward. How Chuck's leveraging of a judge to preside over one of his cases is not necessary to understand, because leveraging the judge moves him one step closer to arresting Axe. If Chuck was successful in acquiring the judge, then the move was successful, and we understand that Chuck made a worthwhile and wise play against Axe. Billions wants you to understand the game that is being played, more so than the tools that are being used to play it. What this does is twofold. People who are more knowledgeable about hedge funds and federal law enforcement get the satisfaction of being in on the plot without having it be drip fed to them ad nauseum. And those of us who know absolutely nothing about these interworkings still get the satisfaction of feeling like we do, because we understand the impact on the characters and the game rather than the impact itself. It's an ingenious method of enlightening the audience without dragging them through a tedious TED talk every five minutes. And it's one that leaves me feeling wiser and more engaged even when I'm missing the finer details. This supplement of understanding extends to the second major method Billions uses to keep the audience engaged. The myriad of real world pop culture, historical, and philosophical references that the characters quip with. Everything from philosophical allegories to historical battles, to psychological tricks and mind games, to sports events and players, even famous movie characters and actors. You're gonna be our Brian Doyle. Who? I like to call the prisoner's dilemma. No, you don't like to call it that. That's what it's called. Started as a thought experiment, game theory in the 50s. Does no one ever check you on this bullshit? You stole my fucking idea. You're like Polly Panino. Who? Uh, let me... Be General Bradley to your patent and advise you to practice restraint. Ah, uh, okay. I was good advice when Omar Bradley gave it. Safe. <laughs> and one of them died a well-respected and admired general, and the other one died a legend. OK, 
Characters and villains will refer to these things to reinforce their arguments, cement their wit or charm, but most importantly, to remind the audience that this is the highest stakes game of ideology there is. Losing in this game will cost you much more than shame, money, or your job. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I understand every cultural illusion, every quip, every real world reference, because I don't. But again, I'm the type of person that wants my shows to teach me something, to make me pay attention, to keep me entertained as much as it's keeping me thinking. And every time I hear one of those references and I do understand, I'm reminded that I'm watching something real, something with a clear message and theme it's encouraging me to learn, and something that has gone to great lengths to ground its characters and their ideologies with a real sense of believability, gravitas, and credibility. When was the last time you watched a show that referenced Hans Gruber from Die Hard without actually saying the words Die Hard? How about commending someone for their Kakashi style move, a slogan for tricking your opponent into abandoning their course of action in the game of Go? Or how about a show with characters that use lines like, I am having a hard time seeing what you are seeing. Perhaps there are real forms behind the shadows on the cave wall. But you can't take that on blind faith. A reference to Plato's cave and the allegory of the shadows on the cave wall. These characters are real, they are intelligent, they're here to win, and they have no intention of slowing down just to make sure we're all on the same page. Axe is the guy who keeps an empire constantly churning throughout his mind, every second of every day. Chuck is someone who could easily attain the highest office in the land if only the job interested him half as much as putting criminals behind bars does. And Wendy is the only psychiatrist on the planet, capable of diving into psyches like theirs, taking them apart, and putting them back together better than they were before. These are some of the brightest minds put to screen, and Billions wants to make sure you believe it. If you still don't believe me, do me a favor and check out the Billions Companion. Some mad lad actually went through the trouble of creating an entire website chronicling every reference explaining where they come from and what they mean. Any show that has inspired its audience enough to create an encyclopedia has done an amazing job incorporating them into the game being played. A hero. Not the hero we deserved, but the hero we needed. Nothing less than a knight. Shining. So, now that I've broken down what kind of players we're dealing with, let's take a deeper dive into the type of game they are playing and why they play it. The short answer to this question would be the gamification of a real world conflict over right and wrong. Game theory involving ethics and morality. Chuck and Axe are engaged in a constant struggle to achieve victory. In the context of Billions, either man's victory is the validation of their descriptive ethics their personal principles of right and wrong. In Billions, there is no simple answer to the question of what is right and what is wrong. On face value, Axe is the villain of this story. He is the criminal who is willing to break the law if it means money or success for his company. Opposite of him, Chuck would be the hero, the government official doing everything in his power to catch the criminal and bring him to justice. Nothing in Billions is that black and white, however, and as the story progresses, the ideology of these characters are constantly put in conflict with one another to highlight the fact that right and wrong is too often a shade of grey. So what then are the ideals of our major players? What does each side believe to be right or wrong? Chuck's entire upbringing was structured and bureaucratic. Private schools, law degrees, trust funds, upper class living, all of these factors being rewards that a civil, lawful, and stable society provide. His entire life has revolved around the law and the ramifications of these rules being followed and obeyed. The law is sacred because it is the law that separates civilization from anarchy. The real heroes from the pretend do-gooders who only care about themselves. Money and success at the expense of these rules is the brass ring that necessitates chaos and ill intent. Now, the law may be a stable and civil set of rules, but that does not always mean these rules are fairly reinforced, and his mission to take down Axe 
forces Chuck to test the limits of this ideal. Chuck views the law as the ultimate deterrent of chaos and corruption. Yet he must also be willing to bend those principles if it means apprehending the epitome of said corruption. Is it right to bend the rules if it is in service of stopping your idealized rule breakers? This is the ultimate test presented by Bobby Axelrod and what Chuck believes will cement his ideology. Chuck knows for certain that he is the one capable of taking down the untouchable Bobby Axelrod. If Chuck must be that martyr for the rule of law, then so be it. No cost is too great for a mission of this magnitude. What he fails to see is that by doing so, he is destroying his own paradigm rather than reaffirming it. The need to destroy his ultimate evil is what is corroding his principles, not the evil itself. Axe, however, knew nothing but chaos. A man born of nothing who clawed his way up from nothing views the chaos as the ultimate test of competence and worthiness. Rules and arbitrary guidelines are merely tools of the weak to hold their position over the strong. The bureaucracy of government is as chaotic and corrupt as any other, but if one understands how best to bend these rules in their favor, the money and success gained is the ultimate equalizer of a free and just society. A modern day personified Robin Hood. He is no criminal, he's just the guy who learned to never play by another man's rules. Rules that are broken and skewed to whomever sits on top. The amount of good and goodwill Axe puts back into society and gives to those around him is arguably on par with Chuck's moral crusade to put away the pretenders. Axe creates unimaginable economic growth and prosperity wherever his power and influence lands. Everything from donations to charities to investments in welfare and social programs, Axe makes certain that enough money goes towards endeavors that even Chuck couldn't question as malicious. The only problem is, unchecked, illegal, and morally ambiguous activity tends to leave a trail of destruction in its wake. And Axe is quick to ignore those whom he has stepped on in the pursuit of his ultimate equalization. Axe refuses to view any of his own actions as criminal or immoral. To do so would be to admit defeat to Chuck and Chuck's philosophy. Axe would be admitting that all of his money, power, and success was gained by cheating a system that he couldn't beat fairly. An unjust system that Chuck mastered and personifies. So instead, Axe must double down. He must push the limits of his already chaotic ideology and do things even the legendary outlaws of old could not. Anything to ensure complete and utter victory over the system, no matter the cost. What you are left with is a dichotomy of moral equivalence. Both of these men are two sides of the same coin. The chaotic hero of their own ethical narrative willing to be evil to correct evil. They believe so strongly in their individually held ideals of right and wrong that they're even willing to destroy themselves if it means the other and their ideology is proven false. So where then does Wendy Rhodes fit into all of this? Well, I view Wendy as the jury proceeding over this continuous debate. She is the conscientious objector with no concrete ideology of her own. A stand-in for the audience that allows us to more easily sympathize with two men who otherwise would be near impossible to relate to. Wendy's affinity for the human mind drives her to help rebuild people into the best versions of themselves. There is no grand scheme or moral quandary incentivizing her actions like there is with Axe and Chuck. In the same vein as most of us watching, she simply wants to do good for the sake of being good and making others feel good. This penchant of Wendy's, however, helped propel Chuck and Axe into the unyielding titans they see themselves as. And because of that, she feels compelled and obligated to be the one who must redirect them away from mutually assured destruction. The dilemma of being caught between two warring psyches that she loves, fears, and wants to protect forces her to become the ultimate referee in their philosophical game over morality. And she'll be damned if two of her greatest accomplishments end up becoming her greatest failures. Can Wendy save either of them from complete and utter annihilation? Or must she abandon the game altogether in order to save herself from becoming collateral damage? In my eyes, Wendy must be the one who decides if the game is worthy of a victor or if it is even worth playing at all. 
As good as Billions is at exploring Axelrod's high stakes billionaire club of hedge fund managers, showcasing Rhodes morally flexible, almost paradoxical cat and mouse game of federal law enforcement, or highlighting Wendy's psychological excavations of the most complex minds on the planet, these qualities still pale in comparison to the philosophical game they play with or against each other to achieve victory. Watching three of the strongest minds and their subordinates essentially play a game of real world 4D chess against each other, one that incorporates knowledge of politics, economics, psychology, philosophy, history, business, and even pop culture, makes for one of the most thought provoking and tragic character rivalries I've ever had the pleasure in experiencing. I could talk about how each season somehow manages to surpass and evolve the season before it. I could talk about how minor events that mean very little in the moment explode into earth shattering revelations, episodes and even seasons into the future. I could talk about the monumental scenes of Chuck and Axe having mono a mono showdowns, the likes of which live up to perfectly choreographed fight scenes, just with ideas and words rather than fists. I could go on. But I think I've made my point when I say that Billions is one of the best shows on television. It is a show where exemplars of powerful people with unwavering ideals are pit against one another in our modern world. And rather than hold your hand, Billions instead encourages you to engage with it, to revel in the game and play it on the same level as Axe, Chuck, and Wendy. These are characters that you will love to see both win and lose. Partaking in one of the most intelligent, engaging, and entertaining philosophical debates ever to be dramatized. Whether that game will end in victory or defeat, I for one will have wished it could have played out forever. That is why you should watch Billions.